Hello and welcome to the American Journal of Psychiatry Resident Journal Podcast. On this episode, guest interviewer Margaret Way brings us an episode on diversity and inclusion. My name is Margaret Way. I'm a second year at UT Southwestern Psychiatry Program. I have with us, Dr. Francis Liu at UC Davis and Dr. Leah Thomas at UT Southwestern. So today we're going to be talking about diversity and inclusion. And the goal of this episode is to help trainees conceptualize a holistic definition of diversity and inclusion, um, teach trainees about the role of diversity and cultural competence in mental health, and also talk about some actionable items that we can do. So with that in mind, I'm going to let our guests introduce themselves. So, Dr. Liu, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this podcast. Um, uh, My uh, title is the Luke and Grace Kim Professor in Cultural Psychiatry Emeritus at UC Davis. Um, I worked uh, 36 years with the University of California, 32 years at UCSF at San Francisco General Hospital, and four years at uh, UC Davis. Dr. Thomas, would you introduce yourself? Sure. And also, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Um, So I'm Dr. Leah Thomas. I am the medical director and a clinician at the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Dallas, Texas, taking care of returning Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, In my academic work, I am an associate professor and the associate program director for the General Psychiatry Residency Program at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Okay, great. We're really excited to have you guys. So we have some questions, um, and this was assembled by students or residents on our Diversity Inclusion Committee headed by Evelyn Ashifu. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to read you some questions and kind of get your thoughts and also would love your feedback or any additional thoughts in the meantime. Okay. So our first question is, the APA's 2017 Statement on Diversity reads, cultural diversity includes issues of race, sex, language, age, country of origin, sexual orientation, religious, spiritual beliefs, social class, and physical disability. Cultural diversity also includes knowledge about cultural factors in the delivery of mental health care and in patient health care related behavior. So how... With all of that being said in that statement, how would you conceptualize diversity and inclusion in a holistic way? Well, this is Francis. I uh, think that uh, what the APA statement says is a a very good place to start uh, by, first of all, explicitly identifying a number of cultural identity variables Uh, not just race and ethnicity, but rather to point out that when we talk about cultural identity of people that we're working with, um, uh, we need to see that cultural identity as an intersection of a number of cultural identity variables. So moving from one, uh, one particular category that uh, might be seen as fixed to a intersection of a number of cultural identity variables, which can change over time. Um, and um, the second point I'd like to make is that I uh, there is a definition of diversity that the Association of American Medical Colleges has uh, put out, which I, I think Uh, goes uh, a little further than what uh, the APA has uh, stated. Um, And uh, perhaps I could speak to that uh, in a moment after I give Dr. Thomas a chance to to say something. Thank you for switching to me. I, as as in the same way as uh, Dr. Liu said, I, I think it is it's wonderfully written in the fact that it's such a broad intersection of opportunities and ideas and conversations to be having there. Um, I think that we really need to think very broadly about how we take care of our patients. And I really applaud the APA for really thinking about this and really trying to uh, get us all to really think about these questions and issues in such a broad manner. I am going to turn it back over to Francis because he does 
have the double AMC definition, which I think is important as we think about both residency education, medical student education, and even thinking about this as patient care as well. Right. So the double AMC uh, definition is is on their website. Uh, if you go to aamc.org um, and then search for uh, GDI, which stands for Group on Diversity and Inclusion, um, and then search on that page, you'll find these definitions. And I'll just read it. It's just uh, two sentences here. Diversity is a core value, uh, as a core value, embodies inclusiveness, mutual respect, and multiple perspectives, and serves as a catalyst for change resulting in health equity. In this context, we are mindful of all aspects of human differences, such as socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, language, nationality, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, geography, disability, and age. So I think the list of cultural identity variables is um, similar to what the APA has stated. I think there may be a few others there, but I think the first sentence uh, does go a little further in that uh, it mentions inclusiveness or inclusion, which we can get to in a moment because the double AMC also has a definition of that, uh, mutual respect and multiple perspectives uh, resulting in health equity. Uh, so this is a very important concept, uh, which is the linking of uh, diversity and inclusion to health equity as a health policy driver. Um, uh, that's one of the six uh, quality outcomes that was enunciated in the 2001 Institute of Medicine report crossing the quality chasm that we need to move our healthcare system towards health equity or reducing disparities. Um, and so this linking very explicitly of diversity and inclusion to um, excellence is very important. Uh, and this um, uh, was put forth originally by Mark Neve. Um, who actually now serves as the chief diversity officer at UT Southwestern yeah, and previously was chief diversity officer at the AAMC. Uh, he put forth the concept of diversity 3.0, meaning that um, diversity is, is very much part of excellence, achieving excellence and health equity as opposed to diversity is over here and excellence is over here, you know, in two different spots, that, which is more like diversity 2.0. Uh, he really sees that um, as very much a part of excellence. And I think this is a position that the AAMC has, has taken um, and other healthcare organizations as well. Um, and so this is, sorry to go on, but just to put a picture on it is that we should not see diversity or cultural competence as the cherry on top of the cake. You know, this is the thinking that people have sometimes that, well, it's just nice to have diversity, but it's just the little decoration. No, no, no. We need to see these diversity cult and inclusion and cultural competence as very much central to excellence in healthcare. Right. Dr. Luth, that was a very great um, description and summary, and thank you for sharing that with us. So, Dr. Thomas, based on your work so far, why do you think it's important to include this at the medical school level and beyond, um, into residency, into faculty training, and where do you think more support is needed in that step? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, 
in the same way, again, our, our AAMC is and the APA and all those organizations and a lot of our health institutions are talking about this because it's really tied to healthcare outcomes. We have had multiple reports from the Institute of Medicine, National Academies talking about the fact that it's important. It's not just a, it's not just a nice thing to say. We acknowledge that when there is a lack of cultural competence, when there's a lack of cultural understanding and awareness of the patients we take care of and serve, patients are feeling un- not heard. Patients are feeling like they're not getting taken care of, which leads to poor health outcomes, which again drives the system and issues along those lines. It's important to be teaching this in medical school. Frankly, it's important to teach it all through high school as well, probably. Um, this, this should not be something that just happens in medicine. We should be thinking about culture and identity and how we take care of one another in all societies. But thinking specifically about medical school, this is where our healers begin their training. And so being able to talk to these folks about what is important. Sometimes our students come from very homogenous backgrounds. Sometimes our medical student colleagues come from very diverse backgrounds. Getting them to talk about those things, helping people understand their experiences and someone else's experiences really helps the healthcare system grow. There is opportunity for experience experience for all of us in benefiting from these conversations about inclusion. Uh, Also, Dr. Liu, I guess same question for you. Where do you feel like more support is needed for people doing this work? Well, I think it's very important uh, for the listeners to be aware of accreditation standards, uh, both at the medical school level, which is the LCME, standing for uh, Liaison Committee on uh, Liaison Committee on Medical Education, the LCME accreditation standards, and the ACGME, Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education, uh, there are very important standards that I I, I would like to uh, go over because I think they provide kind of like the constitutional basis for uh, why uh, medical schools and residencies should uh, care about these things because it's uh, when it's tied to their accreditation, uh, they listen and they will um, they uh, must respond to these accreditation standards. And I think this is it's very important for listeners to know these standards so that they can point them out to uh, people they're working with to get the support that they need. So I I just like to. Uh, to, to, to read them uh, quickly, uh, the first one is for the LCME. Uh, the LCME standard seven is the curricular content, and 7.6 is cultural competence and healthcare disparities. The faculty of a medical school ensure that the medical curriculum provides opportunities for medical students to learn to recognize and appropriately address, that's very important, those two things, recognize and appropriately address gender and cultural biases in themselves, in others, and in the healthcare delivery process. So we're talking about individual biases, but also systems biases. The medical curriculum includes instruction regarding the following. And I'll just read the first three here of four. Uh, The manner in which people of diverse cultures and belief systems perceive health and illness and respond to various symptoms, diseases, and treatments. So that speaks to the cultural concepts of distress and help-seeking. That's what that is on. Secondly is the basic principles of culturally competent health care. And third is recognition of the impact of disparities in health care on medically underserved populations and potential solutions to eliminate health care disparities. So I, I think uh, now this standard uh, more or less existed uh, since uh, uh, 2003 in the LCME. The wording has ba- has changed a little bit over time and, and so on. But uh, this has existed for a long time and I think has 
uh, informed medical student uh, education uh, since that time. And to piggyback off what uh, Dr. Lewis just mentioned, um, in the most recent kind of cycles for ACGME, that's the graduate medical education um, requirements, one of the common program requirements that just was uh, introduced was basically stating that the program in partnership with its sponsoring institution must engage in practices that focus on mission-driven, ongoing, and systematic recruitment of a diverse and inclusive a workforce of residents, fellows of president, present, faculty members, senior administrative staff members, and other relevant members of the academic community. And what was really important is that actually this was some of Francis's own work. And what initially he was doing was just trying to kind of incorporate it for psychiatry. But this is actually something that is a core requirement of all residencies. So it's not just something that psychiatrists are saying and doing. This is something that all medical schools are doing in terms of LCGME guidelines. And all residency programs are also thinking at in terms of ACGME guidelines. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, this is a podcast for listeners interested in psychiatry. But I want them to remember that these are guidelines that are governing all of medical school institutions, all residency institutions. So we're not an outlier. You're not being, it's, this is kind of the core of how we take care of patients all around our institutions, not just something that's like sort of just because we're psychiatrists. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that uh, point. I very much appreciate your uh, bringing this up is the, uh, the the new common program requirement effective July of this year does affect all residencies and all fellowships of all specialties, uh, just as you uh, just as you had stated, and it does close the gap between ACGME and LCME because LCME had a similar diversity and inclusion accreditation standard uh, that. Uh, came on board in 2009. So there's been this 10-year gap. And finally, ACGME has closed it. And um, and my hope is that it will provide a big boost, and then, again, a constitutional type of boost to efforts uh, within residency programs for diversity and inclusion. Um, so Dr. Liu, so based on this work, I know you have done a lot of Uh, advocacy for these competencies. So how have you seen how programs actually measure whether these companies competencies are adequately met? Uh, Dr. Liu, based on your experience, what kind of things in medical training works to teach trainees about this and hasn't worked and needs to improve? Sure. Uh, In terms of um, uh, measurement tools, uh, there is one tool that has been written about called the Diversity and Engagement Survey. Uh, This uh, came out in a um, academic medicine article, uh, volume 90, number 12, December 2015, page 1675 to 1683. And this was a 22-item scale uh, that identified eight factors for diversity and inclusion. And uh, this was done at uh, many sites across the country and went through a validation process. Um, and there are eight um, factors, as I, I mentioned, um, and I could just mention them, uh, that Uh, And there are specific questions that relate to these eight factors. Uh, Common purpose, trust, appreciation of individual attributes, sense of belonging, access to opportunity, equitable reward and recognition, cultural competence, and respect. And uh, I am aware that... uh, uh, institutions have have utilized uh, this scale uh, beyond the original article. I I, I don't know um, uh, much about the outcome of subsequent use of the scale beyond this original article, uh, but I I do recommend it to uh, listeners as a place to start as a way of having a, a measurement tool for uh, diversity and inclusion. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Dr. Thomas, based on your experience 
as APD, how have you seen our program or other programs try to include these competencies and measure their progress and what works and hasn't worked? Um, Well, since it's a new requirement, I think a lot of programs are definitely having conversations about it. At our own program, um, our program director, Adam, Dr. Adam Brenner, has been thinking about this and diversity for quite some time. And so we are definitely kind of actively trying to recruit a diverse uh, population of residents. We're trying to hire diverse faculty. Um, this also has come from not just within our own department, um, but our university president, uh, Dr. Podowski, kind of made it one of his core missions when he first came to our institution. And in his first six-year plan, he basically basically spoke to the need to diversify, to have more diversity um, among department chairs, among um, branches of a university system. And so I think that has been a really big push. I want to actually speak to both kind of medical student education, residency education, um, as Dr. Liu referred to, um, these have been in place since 2003, um, and it's been a nice improvement that they've been there. I remember being a medical student um, and having some pretty atrocious lectures on diversity and inclusion, um, basically lectures that were like, don't stereotype. Now we're going to spend 50 minutes talking about a bunch of stereotypes. Um, And they were pretty atrocious. And I am so glad that we've kind of codified the language of cultural competency. I'm glad that we're trying to intermix this and interinclude it. Um, In our own residency program, one of the things we think about in our didactics is where can we include topics of cultural diversity um, that are in part of the didactic curriculum that aren't this sort of separate thing? Again, on the same way of thinking of the fact that this is part of healthcare, not the cherry on top. So what we've done in some of our lectures is that we include the cultural formulation interview as part of the interviewing course for first year residents. We include conversations about psychiatric diagnosis and cultural issues related to psychiatric diagnosis in our PGY two and three year. And we include them in topics in our PGY four year as well. So it's not meant to be this sort of like, we're going to talk about, we're not pausing to talk about culture. We are adding this into our didactics and part of our process there. Mm, Okay. Yeah. I've been to, well, I only been to the first year lecture for those, but I'm excited to see uh, the continued lectures in PGY2 and PGY3. Um, So based on that, since it's interview season and a lot of our listeners will be visiting programs, how do you suggest they evaluate the diversity support and inclusion uh, commitment at each institution? What kind of things should they ask? What should What should they be looking for? So, Dr. Thomas, since you are an APD, I will ask you first. Sure. Um, I think they're simply allowed to ask, like, what what is the program doing for diversity? And I think they should ask that of both residents and um, faculty as well and see what kind of answers they get. Um, I know that as uh, being a woman of color, I know that many of my medical students and residents of color have often said they look for other residents of color. They're asking those kind of questions. Um, But I don't think it should be simply a question for the underrepresented students. I think that if you're in a program and you're a non-underrepresented student, you should also be asking those questions. What are we doing for diversity? Like, what's what's our policy? What's our plan? Um, I think all of our partners need to be asking those kind of questions. Um, again, both of faculty and program leadership and of residents um, and seeing kind of what the answers are. Dr. Liu, any thoughts of, on that yourself? Great. Uh, well, here are just a couple of pointers that I would suggest. Um, Um, One is to look at the department website to see, um, you know, where diversity and inclusion or cultural competence is mentioned or discussed. Um, Is is there like a a tab uh, on the home page? uh, is there um, is there a description of um, clinical experiences that uh, relate to underserved populations. What does the didactic uh, coursework look like? Um, um, who is on the faculty? Who are uh, who are the residents? Sometimes you have pictures, but uh, beyond the pictures, I think it's important to look at gender. Um, is there any mention of uh, sexual orientation? 
And then is there a diversity advisory committee uh, or is there some uh, interest groups? Uh, for example, at UCSF, um, and, I, and I just mentioned these programs not as a way of advertising, but rather I'm just familiar with them. At UCSF, there is an area of distinction in cultural psychiatry, also for women's mental health and also for LGBT issues that residents can choose to get further uh, learning opportunities during their four years. And I, I'm aware of diversity advisory committees at a number of different programs around the country and uh, also opportunities to serve underserved populations, I think, does vary from program to program as well. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Liu, you worked on a lot of committees and a lot of different projects in this area. Have you ever faced any sort of conflicts within yourself or with the structure at large doing this work? And if so, how did you mitigate that? Well, I think it's very important to work uh, within uh, an organizational structure. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to chair the Council on Minority Mental Health and Health Disparities of the APA from 2002 to 2007. And um, as the chair of that council, uh, we um, you know, passed action items as a council and sent them up to the to the Joint Reference Committee, and then finally to the Board of Trustees, uh, also to the Assembly, uh, to have them uh, vote on things. And respecting that process and working uh, through an organization like APA does make a difference. And I can remember very vividly just one case example was that uh, the APA Board of Trustees asked our council to write a position statement for the APA on, on the issue of same-sex marriage. This was back in 2005, I believe, and uh, or 2006, one of those two years. And so our council did so with the help of Jack Drescher, the chair of the Committee on LGB uh, Psychiatrists at that time. And our council passed it, and then we had to bring it forward to the APA Assembly in order to get it to the Board of Trustees. So, um, and, and we met in Atlanta that year, and we, I and Jack and others went from council to council, uh, pu you know, putting forth uh, the statement uh, in support of legal recognition of same-sex civil marriage. And, and uh, it did pass the assembly. Um, and because we thought that was going to be a big hurdle. And it was only through the help of um, people in the assembly who, um, who uh, helped make that happen. And once it passed the assembly, uh, we thought it would be easy to pass at the board level, which it did. Uh, so uh, that's just one example that comes to mind right away. Mm -hmm. I think you were the first person of non-LGBTQ orientation to win an award because of this work? Uh, yes, uh, you're very perceptive. I think it was in 2003, uh, the Association of Gay and Lesbian Psychiatrists gave me a Distinguished Service Award uh, for specifically for my work in including LGBT issues as part of cultural competence training. Uh, and that's been a, uh, a, a, a point of view that I have enunciated from the very beginning, uh, that cultural competence uh, includes a number of cultural identity variables as described in the APA definition or statement on diversity. Mm. I see. Um, so, Dr. Thomas, I know you recently wrote a paper about being a person of color going through medical training. How has doing this work felt for you coming from that position? Ha! Huh, that's a good question. It's kind of a labor of love. You know, uh, I actually remember 
I, I have to say this. It's a nice public forum to say this in. So, uh, Dr. Liu, you and I met at an uh, academic psychiatry conference. Um, you were giving sort of talks with people on cultural psychiatry, and it was just nice to talk to you. And the first thing you said to me was, you are not alone. And it was probably the most heartwarming thing Um I had said to me in a very long time, when I did my residency, I was the at one point the only black woman in my residency program. Um, and there's still very few uh, black psychiatrists kind of overall. Um, I was doing medical school interviews, um, interviewing medical students and a young woman, it's what I wrote about in my in my perspective piece, a young woman kept coming up to me because she said I was the only black woman or pers- even black person she'd seen while interviewing. And I was shocked, but it also made sense to me. It's been it's been tough and challenging work. And definitely it really helps, like Dr. Liu has said, to work within organizational structures, to have good colleagues and allies to help you do this kind of work. Um, and I hope to keep doing it. Okay. So some of our um, residents also wanted to know, so we usually find that residents and faculty who work on these diversity inclusion initiatives usually come from an array of backgrounds themselves. And so although it's wonderful to have people who can directly identify with the importance of improving diversity inclusion, how would you suggest we can gain buy-in of those who may not see its relevance at first glance? Yes. Um, well, I, I, I think uh, referring back to the constitutional statements, um, and we we went through the ACGME common program requirement on diversity and inclusion that, uh, that Dr. Thomas read uh, uh, earlier. But in addition to that, for specifically for psychiatry, you know, there are specific accreditation standards for psychiatry residency training programs. And while there's not a specific section, standalone section on cultural competence, if you go through those accreditation standards, and a new set just came out in July 2019, there are places that definitely speak to cultural competence. Uh, so just to give you a quick example, there's a section on uh, residents must have competence in working with a diverse patient population, and they specify a number of cultural identity variables. Then at a deeper level, there's one on must be able to establish a therapeutic alliance with patients from a number of diverse backgrounds. And again, a number of cultural identity variables are specified. Then at yet a deeper level, there is mention of the importance of understanding the cultural elements of the relationship between the resident and the patient, including uh, dynamics of difference in cultural identity, values, and power. So that speaks directly, or that's equivalent to Part D of the Outline for Cultural Formulation in DSM-5, and is a very important competence for residents to achieve. Um, And and then finally, uh, there is a section on professionalism where it states that residents must develop respectful and responsive attitudes for diverse populations, again, with the number of cultural identity variables. So in summary, these these are four uh, 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 competencies that are stated in the um, RRC document, the Accreditation Standards for Psychiatry Residency Training Programs, which, um, which can be pointed to um, in in uh, in discussions with uh, leadership of departments of psychiatry, uh, that th- this is really a part of what needs to be taught, and we want to make sure that these areas are are covered and and incorporated. I think, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, uh, the 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 uh, incorporation of these uh, ideas throughout the didactics, rather than some standalone courses, is a very uh, important and helpful strategy. Okay. So, Dr. Thomas, um, do you have any thoughts on what uh, we, ha- what Dr. Liu has discussed so far, and also any thoughts on how we can address this at our own residency program? So, I think 
I think in the in the way that uh, you know Dr. Liu has mentioned the the milestones and things like that. I think the way to have everyone at the table thinking about this is these are the things that make you a good psychiatrist. These are the things that help you that help we we can teach you. We want to support you and help you move towards being the best psychiatrist that you can be. So it's not that it's this like thing I have to learn on the side. No, this is part of how we identify as being a psychiatrist. How we identify as taking care of our patients. And so getting to know our patients in all aspects of their lives, including the part, their cultural identity, the things that make them unique and important, the things that they define to themselves as important to their treatment and care. How can you do good care if you don't know these things about patients? How can you do good care if you don't understand the cultural background? How can you do good care if you don't know or don't wish to identify or address those issues? That's avoidance and therapy for both you and the patient and not going to get you very far. That, that is a very psychiatrist comment. <laughs> Doing what I can. All right. Thank you both for your time today. Um, so our last question for you is that I know you guys have talked about getting involved at institutional levels with organizations, um, sorry, I mean, getting involved with organizations and larger structures. So for medical trainees, how do you suggest they can improve the diversity of their program at a very practical level? And what can a program do to be, so I know we talked about the didactics piece to improve the educational piece of a cultural competency curriculum. Well, this is Francis. I, um, I, I'm, um, I would hope that uh, residency training programs do have opportunities for residents to serve on various committees, such as the Education Committee or the Resident Selection Committee. Um, and uh, so take that as an example. As a member of the Residency Selection Committee, you could participate in interviewing um, and giving comments at the selection committee meeting about candidates and advocate for um, diverse candidates who are, um, you know, who could who could help the department in this way. Uh, I think that that that's a very that's a very concrete step that residents can take. Um, you could uh, apply for APA fellowships. Uh, for example, the APA SAMHSA Minority Fellowship. Um, and also the Diversity Leadership Fellowship are just two examples amongst many others. Okay. Yeah, that, that would be a great opportunity for residents. Um, and then, Dr. Thomas, how do you suggest that we can improve our, let, let's use our program as an example, um, I guess, opportunities for residents and also our existing cultural competency program? Um. So I serve as faculty advisor for our residency-led uh, diversity and inclusion committee that serves as a subcommittee of our residency education committee. And I know that our uh, current resident uh, chair is always looking for new members. Um, and so that is one thing we're thinking about. We're also uh, adding some new programming uh, to, our pro uh, to our residency in terms of having a diversity day and we're actually having an invited speaker to have one of our grand rounds and special education sessions on um, diversity and inclusion um, and speaking specifically to marginalization as a topic. Um, I'm really excited about that happening in our January program. I think we're just hoping as best we can through residency fairs, through our didactics, through our process, um, looking for um, ways to incorporate and encourage more uh, diverse resident population. I also think that it's not just sort of looking at our residency. I often think about the fact that when we think about ways to incorporate and include a diverse um, applicant pool, you need to think about how we re can recruit people into psychiatry at a very kind of early age. We know there's a lot of stigma in some of our communities of color about engaging in mental health care. And so the more we can do to do community outreach, um, the more potential we have to have more future psychiatrists uh, from our communities of color. Yes, and yeah, some of these initiatives in our own residency program is pretty exciting, and I'm pretty excited about the upcoming seminar as well. Um, so I think those are our questions. Thank you both for being speakers on this podcast. We learned so much from both of you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting us.